Hello, hello, welcome. Um, welcome to the second session of the day. Um, I will be your moderator. My name is Michael Falcon. Um, this second session is titled Maintaining a Pain Management Regi Regime with Managing COVID-19. Today we have uh, four amazing speakers for this session. It's gonna go quick and quick and fast um, to get through all four sessions and then we're gonna have a consecutive Q&A session, um, little chat right after. Um, as these speakers are, are, are speaking and you're watching their videos of their presentation, we do ask that you get um, your questions in as soon as possible. And even as the videos are going um, on the back end, we're going to be um, fumbling around trying to find, you know, figure out which, what are the best questions to ask and how we're going to present them and all those things. So it's really going to help us and myself, um, if I'm being completely honest, uh, to sort through all those questions and figure out what we want to do. A little bit about myself, I'm an occupational therapist. I work with GAPA um, through IASP and I also live with chronic pain. So this is something that is definitely personal to me and I'm excited to hear uh, the presentations that we have going. So we have Andrea Furlan, Katie Napton, Sharon Goldberg and Marta Imamura. And with that, let's go ahead and get into the presentations and we'll see you guys on the other side. I'll be talking about lived experience of managing persisting pain, COVID-19 and long COVID. I'm Sharon Goldbear, a healthcare professional working with people experiencing persisting pain, having lived that myself for many years in the past. And now for the past year, just over a year, managing long COVID symptoms alongside managing pain. In May 2020, after months of over 50 symptoms, including a resurgence of old pain and some new ones, I discovered after reading a BMJ article that I ticked the boxes for what patients were calling long COVID. Joint pain, muscle pain, tight calves, vulval pain, sciatica. I'd experienced all of these things in the past and back they came in waves. Pins and needles, peripheral neuropathy, costochondritis and the weirdest headache were all new. Later, Dr. Andrea Furlan will be talking about COVID-19 symptoms through the acute phases and what pain medications may help or hinder. Now, for me, I didn't know. Sure, I felt a little bit hot and had a headache and an odd, very itchy rash that wouldn't shift and then a variety of other symptoms that came and went in waves. In the UK, the NHS site makes no mention of these other symptoms. The CDC does mention headache, but how could I be sure? I had varying symptoms for months. So I paid privately for an antibody test, which came back negative. So when I came across the BMJ article, I then went on to join the Long COVID support group and met a large number of people with the same set of symptoms. Great, so I wasn't going mad. This group now has over 39,000 members and it's where I source the best info. Pointed towards papers, research and sensible advice. The problem was I'd made a mistake. I'd been pushing through. My symptoms had been mild to start off with. I didn't know, so I'd continued work and as I say, just push through. And then with each wave, it was worse. I had been able to go for walks and exercise and practice yoga, but even a short walk for five minutes was starting to exhaust me. And with vulval pain, Physio is a good route to managing symptoms. And I'd been practicing physio too. So unfortunately, this pushing through was definitely the wrong thing to do. If we have a infection or flu, sensible action would be of course to stop and rest. But of course, I didn't know. Dr. Marta Imamura will shortly talk about COVID-19 pathophysiology and structured assessment. Pacing is an important part of managing persisting pain and recovery out of acute phase of COVID-19, pacing is really important. And if we don't pace, 
then the consequence can be post-exertional malaise. This isn't just tiredness. You know, there were many moments that I could just close my eyes and, and fall asleep. And, you know, I had done so as well. It also means that two or three days after activity, and that doesn't have to be too much activity, maybe a walk or physio, I'd feel flu-like symptoms. You know, it really felt like someone had just taken a hammer to me in the nighttime. That's how I felt when I woke up in the morning. And it's when I knew that I'd experienced this before, post-viral fatigue after flu. I'd experienced it a couple of times before, and it started dawning on me that, you know what, I most likely probably had had COVID-19. post exertional malaise is real, but sadly, I've been told by clinicians, even from long COVID clinics, to exercise. Each time I chose to listen to them, rather than what I knew and what I kind of felt within me when I tuned in, I relapsed badly. So clinicians, healthcare professionals, please check for contraindications. NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence have altered their recommendations of graded exercise therapy for CFS, for chronic fatigue syndrome. Whilst we're not necessarily talking about CFS with long COVID, please <laughs> let it be that we continue improving. We can do well listening to feedback from patients and patients just tuning into what might be right for you. And again, clinicians, healthcare professionals can do well by consulting with colleagues. My GP, primary care physician, was upfront about not being knowledgeable about long COVID. He decided to check in with me weekly at first just to see, and also mainly what I might have learned from the long COVID group. There is still a gap in knowledge. Please show patients that you're interested. Katie Napton will be talking more about post-exertional malaise and pacing in a short while. And listen to feedback from patients. Patients are the experts here, so do listen to their experience. I had a couple of lovely paramedics who took me to A&E due to tachycardia and other odd symptoms they need to rule out that I was having a stroke. And I had a number of tests done, but my symptoms fluctuate. And some hours later, a consultant mentioned in passing anxiety. Now, he only had to take a look at me to notice that I was far from anxious. I just wanted to go home. And anxiety isn't the issue here. And it probably isn't for many people. So don't dismiss people. If you don't have answers, just own up and say you don't know. Talk to your colleagues and find out more. And when it comes to video consultations, as with physical in the room consultations, be mindful of facial expressions, body languages, what you might be giving out and what we might be communicating to patients. And if it's a telephone consultation, please bear in mind still, in the words of Paul Vatslavik, one cannot not communicate. On the phone, not only do your words matter, but your voice tone, the pacing. I had a telephone consultation with a clinician after months of waiting. His tone was rather gruff, hurried, almost like I could hear him tutting on the other end of the phone. Please be mindful, we're human. And we may have been waiting a while and just want some answers. That consultation was rushed through in seven minutes and I was told to exercise. I was pretty upset afterwards and I'd actually prepared. And you know what, body language may matter even if you are practicing telehealth. It may affect your voice tone and how you convey your message to a patient. So check in with yourself. Are you in a position? Do you feel comfortable enough to, to offer best care? And you know, what are we communicating? Some of the information that physicians convey to their patients can inadvertently amplify patient symptoms and become a source of heightened somatic distress. Please let's avoid nocebo. And a final word on pacing. In the acute phase, stop and rest. It's a must. Coming out, we 
pace as we would with persisting pain. And it's a judgment call on what may be okay to do to stay within our energy pocket and just see. And with long COVID, we may be talking micro pacing. What can I do today? What can I afford to let go of today? You know, it might be today I'll shower, but it might mean I can't cook. And the other thing is cognitive pacing. One of my favorite things to do is read. And for months, every time I picked up a book and tried to read, I could read a couple of sentences and just feel exhausted. And a few months later, when I tried, I would try and push through, but you know, a couple of days later, I would relapse. And so really, pacing does mean cognitive pacing too. And rest, if you feel. I'll shut my eyes for five or 10 minutes sometimes. And it can mean that I can function a little bit better afterwards. And that's okay. Whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, 15 minutes, sometimes a bit longer. Just listen to what your body or your mind may be communicating. Go at your pace. Tune into yourself. This is about self care. And communicating what your body or mind may be saying to healthcare professionals and to others. A couple of my symptoms included light and noise sensitivity. I couldn't tolerate other people speaking or even hearing myself speaking. So jot down key points beforehand, you know, bit by bit. So that when you are communicating with others or in an appointment, you have a, a better chance to get your voice heard and your points across. I wonder how, as clinicians, we can encourage this. Because brain fog doesn't help when patients are put on the spot. So clinicians, please listen carefully. If you can see your patient in person or a video consultation, then really open your eyes and see and watch. What are you seeing here? If you're on the phone, really listen and hear the patient and also tune into voice tone. What are they telling you? And what might they be missing out? Are there things that you need to know that they might not be telling you. Communication works both ways. Finally, patients and clinicians, be gentle with yourself. We're all going through this learning curve. Let's just do the best we can, work together, share knowledge, and collaborate. Hi, this webinar will provide an overview on how to maintain a current chronic pain management regimen after a person living with chronic pains diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, this might involve some discussion on non-prescription medications usage to manage COVID-19 symptoms in conjunction with any prescription medications for chronic pain, how to assess symptoms and self-manage COVID-19 symptoms for those in the short and long term, and when to see your doctor. My name is Andrea Forlan, and I am from the University of Toronto in Canada, and I'm representing also my hospital, Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, UHN. And I'll be talking about maintaining a pain regimen with an acute COVID-19 infection. So I hope that at the end of this presentation, participants will be able to identify situations that are critical for patients to manage chronic pain during an acute viral infection such as COVID-19. Also establish some principles and criteria for urgent treatment of pain during an acute episode of COVID-19 and be aware of risks of opioid treatment during an acute episode of COVID-19. In terms of conflict of interest, the only two things that I thought was uh, relevant to mention is that I have a monetized YouTube channel 
And I also receive unrestricted educational grants to maintain an online opioid self-assessment program from the Canadian Generic Pharmaceutical Association. Well, I brought some cases. These are not real patients and not real pictures, but uh, these are based on the experiences of working clinic over the last uh, year during the pandemic. So I kind of brought some cases together that were common uh, with our population of chronic pain. So uh, the first fake patient is Nancy. She's a 34 year old female. She has fibromyalgia, migraines, endometriosis, hypermobility. She has sleep problems, depressive mood. She works from home. She does not smoke, does not use any alcohol, no cannabis, and she bikes 25 kilometers every week. For medications, she uses duloxetine, 120 milligrams a day. She is using tramadol, 200 milligrams a day, and gabapentin, 300 milligrams a night. She got COVID. She had symptoms of uh, shortness of breath, chest pain, and abdominal pain. So the questions that I, we had when she approached us was, um, can she continue taking her chronic pain medication, which includes opioid tramadol, with the possibility of respiratory depression and it could lower her oxygen saturation? Can she take additional medication for pain caused by the COVID, like uh, anti-inflammatories, acetaminophen, anti-cough medication, anti-nausea medication? She's concerned if the COVID-19 symptoms are going to make her chronic pain worse and if there is anything she can do to prevent it. She heard about the long haulers and she's scared of her chronic pain becoming worse. So this is what uh, our answers of our team was. Well, uh, she, should be con she should continue taking her chronic pain medication, especially because uh, if she stops taking the tramadol, she might go on withdrawals and that could precipitate her going to an emergency department and we don't want her to do that. Whereas if she decides to taper slowly the tramadol, but she, not, she should not co turkey stop taking tramadol. Can she take any other medication? Yes, uh, treat COVID-19 as any viral infection. So it could be, what do we do when we have a flu, a cold? We use other medications to treat nausea and headaches and fever. So treat COVID-19 as any other viral infection. So they can take these additional medications. And then she was concerned about um, uh, yes, there is a chance that uh, some people will become sensitized. There is a, the virus can sensitize the pain system, cause more central sensitization, uh, neuropathic pain, small fiber neuropathies, uh, micro strokes in the brain. So there is a possibility that her chronic pain will become chronic and worse, uh, but uh, we it's not the majority of people. The majority of people will recover without any sequela. And we don't know anything that we can do to prevent these long-term consequences of COVID-19. The other case was Charlie. He is 45 years old. He has chronic low back pain, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. He works in a restaurant. He smokes 20 cigarettes a day. He does not exercise regularly. He goes for massage, acupuncture, spinal manipulation every week. He doesn't take any medication. Occasionally, he takes acetaminophen or ibuprofen. And he gets uh, some spinal injections every two or three months in a pain clinic. He got COVID and was admitted to hospital for four weeks. And he, uh, he did not need ventilation, but he was bedridden because he was so weak. He couldn't even move for four weeks. And, th and then there were some questions to the team. So during the hospital admission, if his low back pain gets worse, can he receive the massage, acupuncture, spinal manipulations that he was receiving when he was an outpatient? If his low back pain is getting worse during admission, can he receive opioids? And can he receive spinal injections while he is admitted to the hospital? Because the team that does the injections is right in the hospital. Could they come and do the injections or could he go and receive the spinal injections? So those things were discussed. And of course, uh, for acupuncture massage, the chiropractic manipulation, it really depends on the hospital policies regarding contact with patients who are in isolation. He was in isolation, he was contagious. And if that is allowed, and it's, it, it could be helpful as it was helpful for his chronic pain that he was receiving those treatments every week. But you, we need to check with infection control. 
Um, could he receive opioids? Well, he, he didn't receive any opioids for his chronic back pain before, but it really depends on his lung function, his oxygenation, his cognitive status, and his general health status. If he is stable and oxygenation is adequate, the team could might consider a short-acting opioids for a short period of time. Uh, we know that also opioids may help with shortness of breath uh, in low doses, so that could help both pain and the shortness of breath. Now, could he receive these spinal injections? Could we send him to the uh, interventional pain doctor? Actually, it's in the just the other floor of the hospital. Well, it really depends on how severe his pain is, if his status is stable, if uh, the infection control does not have any issues, with the team coming to his bedroom or, or he going to the interventional uh, procedure, um, like uh, transferring to another uh, ward of the hospital or even transferring him to another hospital to get the procedure. And we were talking to the interventional pain doctors and we would say avoid any steroid injections because there is association with worse immune response to cars. Um, just so people know, the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, they released some guidelines for interventional pain procedures during COVID-19 infections. Uh, not exactly during an acute episode, maybe, but uh, more in the chronic pain patients who got COVID. So they have this algorithm. Do we know what is the COVID status of the patient? In this case, we knew that the patient is contagious, that he was in isolation. So if we need, it's better to wait until, until he is out of isolation. But if his chronic pain, low back pain is getting a lot worse, and it was because he was bedridden, then we need to think about some uh, procedures to make him more comfortable at the hospital. The other case is a 70-year-old male, honey. Uh, he is widow. Uh, he had posthepatic neuralgia, and he had a constant chronic facial pain because his uh, herpes zoster affected his face. He was on pregabalin maximum dose, 600 milligrams a day. He was receiving morphine, 75 milligrams a day, in divided dose of long-acting opioids. I think he was on 45, 40 in the morning and 35 in the evening. Amitriptyline, 75 milligrams a day. He lives alone. He owns a farm in rural Ontario. His daughter, only daughter he has, lives in Australia, so the other side of the world no close family around, and he has some friends from his community church. Well, he got COVID, he went to the hospital, but did not need admission. The problem was he has a lot of fever, cough, weakness, loss of appetite. We were concerned about sending him home. Uh, is it safe for him to be alone in the house with all of these medications uh, for pain and also for symptom control of the COVID-19? Is there something that his primary care provider could do to avoid any complication of his chronic pain and the COVID-19 while he was, because he was left alone at home in the middle of a rural area in a farm? Does he need to take any medication for fever and which medication should that be? Is it necessary to switch his morphine to another opioid because morphine impairs immune response? So the first one, um, we were concerned that because of his uh, cough and infection and fever, he's 70 years old, he could be delirious, he could be confused uh, with all of these medications, he could overdose. Even if he has an naloxone kit at home, all of our patients who are on opioids here in Ontario, we tell them to get an naloxone kit at home, which is the antidote for overdose. But even if he has one, there's nobody there to administer if he overdoses on the morphine. So he could make errors on his pain medication and that could be fatal. So we advocated for his family doctor, primary care provider to admit him to a hospice or a rehabilitation bed. Uh, that was not an option. We thought about um, asking a caregiver to come and spend time uh, with him at least a few hours a day so he would not need to be alone uh, in the house, in the farm and someone that could observe uh, his uh, 
if he is uh, loss of consciences and uh, especially at night. He could take medications for uh, his fever because if he has a fever, then chances would be that he would be more delirious. So we recommended him to take a acetaminophen and to measure his temperature on a regular basis. And um, we didn't think that switching him, his morphine to another opioid would be a good option at this point. We know that morphine impairs immunity, but we think that we thought that switching to another opioid would involve a lot of instability on his opioid medications, and we didn't want to do that. We know that uh, there, is, there are some articles showing that um, people on opioids, uh, especially codeine, morphine, fentanyl, and methadone, there is immune response um, uh, delayed, and that could impair his uh, uh, antiviral uh, response to the COVID medication, uh, to the COVID infection. The fourth case is Patty. Uh, she's a 68 year old female living with her husband and her son. She has severe spinal stenosis. She was not a good candidate for surgery, so she's treating conservatively. She has osteoarthritis of the hips, hands, shoulders, cervical spine, severe osteoporosis. She has PTSD because her daughter committed suicide at home and she was the one who found her daughter dead. Uh, so she's doing psychotherapy once a week for this PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. She's on a fentanyl patch, 25 micrograms an hour. She changes every three days and the other medication she takes is only blood pressure medication. She's very active at home. She's volunteering at a local community center. She walks daily. She got COVID-19, no severe symptoms. She did not even need to go to the hospital. She's at home, but because she's having low grade fever, she's sweating a lot because of the fever. Every time her fever goes down, she sweats a lot. She's also uh, having loss of appetite and smell. The problem that we had is her, her Fentanyl patch was not adhering properly to the skin because of the sweats and the fever. And the question was, do we need to switch her fentanyl patch because it's not adhering? And um, there was nothing that we could do to adhere because she sweats. There was no part of her body that I was not sweating. And we were afraid that uh, she would go on withdrawals or even worse, if she was not using the patch for a couple of hours and then she puts the patch again and absorbs because when she has fever, the temperature of the body goes higher and then absorbs a lot, she could get an overdose. And the other concern we had was um, she stopped going to the psychotherapist for PTSD because the psychotherapist, she had to go there and she was contagious and the psychotherapist didn't want to see her. So how we solve those problems, um, we assessed uh, for her withdrawal symptoms and we used the CALS uh, score. I'll show you the CALS score in the next page. So when she was not having withdrawal symptoms, nothing needs to be done, but uh, in case of mild or moderate um, CALS uh, withdrawal symptoms, then we should consider switching her fentanyl patch to an oral opioid and we would consider oxycodone or hydromorphone. In terms of, so this is the CALS uh, score, so you can download this, and uh, there's a reference at the end of this presentation. And uh, in terms of her mental health counseling, uh, that she was going to the psychologist to talk to the psychologist, we arranged for her to have telephone or video conference um, psychotherapy, so she didn't need to stop. Uh, it was really helpful for her mood, sleep, and anxiety, and instead of uh, having the face-to-face -face sessions. So the American Medical Association recommends some um, changes in policies and especially authorizing patients to get opioids. Uh, you know, we are living in the middle of pandemic and sending prescriptions directly to the pharmacy, especially related to opioids, uh, waiving the limits and restrictions on, on how much opioids people can get, uh, requirements for um, in-person counseling to get the refuse of opioids. Also enhancing a lot of home delivery medication options, reducing barriers to vital pain medications and, uh, and doing everything possible to get uh, telephone consults or video conference uh, with patients in this time of pandemic. And uh, that psychologist was very accommodating and helpful and uh, did that for our patient. So here are some principles for managing chronic pain in the context of COVID-19. 
how severe is the pain? Um, is it an acute, a new pain problem? Uh, what are the pain medications the patient is using? More attention should be given if there are opioids and risks of withdrawals or risks of overdose. What can be done to keep patients at home, avoid overcrowding emergency departments and avoid admission to hospital? What can be done uh, for patients with chronic pain if they are admitted to hospitals? Is there an acute pain service that can be consulted and make the patients more comfortable while they are in hospital for their COVID recovery? Uh, also, don't forget that there are comorbidities, like mental health comorbidities could be very much aggravated uh, during the isolation and quarantine periods. Uh, is there any social situation, like caregivers available? Who is there to provide support to our patients? Another question we get a lot is, um, you know, people with chronic pain, they are afraid to go to hospital. They're afraid of uh, a new pain um, problem. When should they really seek medical care? I don't mean going to emergency, but I mean even calling your pain doctor and say, you know, I have a new pain. I, you know, I'm, 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 I have chronic pain, but now I'm having something that is different. When should they call or go to emergency? If they are an oncologic patient, if there is a new episode of acute herpes zoster or an acute trigeminal neuralgia or an acute complex regional pain syndrome, or patients who have neuromodulators or implantable pumps, patients with severe osteoporosis because they may have a acute uh, fracture or when they need refuse for medications, especially, especially opioids, benzos, antidepressants, anticonvulsants and cannabinoids because those medications, we don't want them to stop and wait until the pandemic is finished for them to restart the treatment. Also, if they have an acute episode of a headache without any previous history of headaches or if they're having chest pain. So who is at high risk of more severe chronic COVID-19 disease? We know that having chronic pain does not put you or any patient at a higher severe COVID-19 disease. Unless uh, if there is any other of these comorbidities here, we know that older adults, people with other comorbidities like lung diseases, hypertension, diabetes, kidney, liver, dementia, stroke, or any person who is immune compromised or people with obesity. So we know that people who are receiving opioids, coding, methadone, fentanyl, or methadone, they are at high risk of immune uh, compromise. So they should be careful uh, if they get a COVID-19 infection. What kind of medical care is available to patients with chronic pain? Uh, we should aim at telephone consultations, even talking to the pharmacist and nurses, social worker, telemedicines. Avoid going to the walk-in clinics or primary care pro providers because there might be issues of available PPE. You may need to call the clinic first to see if it's okay for you to go and visit the clinic and in severe cases, go to emergency department. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope that we were able to reach those uh, goals uh, that I set at the beginning of my presentation. These are the references of the study that I mentioned, and thank you very much. Hi, my name is Katie Lepton. I'm a physiotherapist, and I'm really honored and delighted to be part of this webinar today. So my disclosures, I run my own private practice based here in Sussex in the UK. I've also set up an online clinic and that's called PhysioFast Online. I collaborate with Pete Moore and if you haven't heard of Pete Moore, then please look him up. He has written a pain toolkit and this is to help people manage, self-manage um, persistent pain. And together with Pete, I have written a free self-help guide for long COVID sufferers. So, there's the reference there. Please do send us any information, feedback, resources that you'd like added or changed if you see any typos, because we're always adapting it and changing it as, as more things come to light. And, and this is really to try and help people who haven't got underlying medical issues um, to self-manage a little bit more freely. Um, and we're not earning any, I've got no financial interest in So what am I hoping to cover? So um, a brief overview of long COVID, 
but um, not not going into too much detail because we've got more knowledgeable uh, medical people speaking so I'm not going to try and go there so I'm just going from what I've seen in the community and what I've found so the common ongoing symptoms presented basically in my clinic or online and strategies for persistent pain patients having to also cope with the, the horror of long COVID. The long COVID, so we know that it's got over 200 described symptoms, and I know Shireen would have shared her story. Um, so what, what things can it affect? So we know it's pulmonary, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, reproductive. I've had many um, ladies in their sort of mid 40s coming over with perimenopausal symptoms, which has been really interesting. And I know there's quite a lot of work researching that. Endocrine problems, renal. There's neurological, which we're fairly familiar with in terms of headaches, insomnia, sleep disturbance. There's peripheral neuropathies, dizziness and brain fog. And then the brain fog also overlaps into the psychological stuff. So that's depression and anxiety. There's ear, nose and throat. So the, the classic um, loss of taste and smell, sometimes that can last longer than three months. There's tinnitus earache, sore throat, permanent sort of cold feeling. There's ophthalmic, so I've spoken to an optician recently who's had a few interesting eye presentations post COVID. There's dermatological, so that's skin rashes. And then you're more general, so that's your fatigue, your post-exertion malaise, fever, regular fevers going up and down, and this can carry on for a long time and then also pain. So this can be new pains or exacerbations of old pains. And the problem with it is it's remitting and relapsing. So it's not standard, it's very tricky to manage. So the ones I'm dealing with is going to be fatigue, your post-exertion malaise, shortness of breath, brain fog, and palpitations of the heart. And those are, are what I've seen with the patients that are presented to me. But obviously, you know, others, other clinicians will have seen lots of other things. So long COVID and persistent pain strategies, we need to, to think about how do we go about managing or helping patients manage this? So I guess some of it is the accepting and hopefully if they've um, attending clinic, then they've recognized that there is an issue beyond what their norm is. Um, so accepting that they've got a long COVID diagnosis because they may never have had a COVID test. They potentially never been into to hospital. And also checking that they've got the team. So we always recommend that anyone with persistent pain has a supportive network around them because it's really hard to manage. Um, with long COVID on top of this, you're really going to need a reliable and understanding team. Pacing. It will be a huge time to review pacing. You're going to have to really organise and monitor symptoms. You're going to have to prioritise and plan. So this is part of your pacing, pacing organisation. Review goals. So it's looking at what's essential, what needs to be done, what can wait, and monitoring that. It's really hard not to want to push on through, especially if you've got to a stage that you were managing everything. You need to advise patients to be nice to themselves. And with that, they need to set time aside to relax. Now, this relaxing is variable from individual to individual. individual sorry, um, They might want to set up some meditation, you, they might want to be advised on some nice music or television, whatever works for them, but they need to be nice to themselves and to relax. Movement. Now, this isn't particularly controversial. We need to move a little bit, but we're not talking about mass physical activity. And again, this is going to vary depending on how they are feeling. But we would encourage, even if they're feeling quite bed bound, just going through some very gentle exercises. And that may just be some gentle arm movements, some gentle breathing work. Having a setback plan. So this is comes back round to the team. You may that have a setback plan that includes perhaps taking some more pain relief and that might be under your GP. 
um, but it's working out how do you manage when, especially with the remitting and relaxing pattern, how are you going to manage this? Teamwork. So this is vital. So we've already touched on this. And it's just checking the teamwork. This can be made up of friends, family, physios, other therapists, GPs, hospital if needed. But you need a team behind. And this is one of the reasons, because of the fatigue, the severe exhaustion. And I know it, persistent pain patients, this is not totally unfamiliar, but it can be totally overpowering with long COVID. And it's not really relieved by rest. And basically, it's a bit of a car crash. So it's a total stop. So it's not to be ignored. And anyone presenting with fatigue needs to be really looked after. And this can tie in hand in hand with this post-exertion malaise. And this gives real warning, warning bells and warning signs. And any activity can bring on this. So this can be just a thinking too much, having to do a sort of high thought process activity. Whatever you find hard, some people find even just doing a jigsaw can, can set this off. And the effect can be immediate. Or it can be 24 to 72 hours post-exertion, which is what makes it tricky to manage. And we as clinicians really want people to avoid this as, as, as much as possible because it takes a long time to recover from. And I mean, when we say long time, this can be days, weeks and even months. And it is a setback because the problem with it is it tends to take you way back. So it's not recommended. And this has been sort of a bit of controversy because initially the guidelines talked about um, doing graded exercise therapy, so GET, um, and it's now moved away from that because of this post-exertion malaise. We do not push people into an exercise program at all. So this takes us back into pacing. So I like this. Um, this is the ME Association's description of pacing, and I think this works well and is not unfamiliar to people with persistent pain. Its activities, both physical and mental, should be carried out in small, manageable chunks, with a period of rest or relaxation in between. It's important to stop any form of activity before an exacerbation of fatigue or other symptoms occur. So this is finding your energy envelope. So everything that's contained, you can do, but if you go out of that envelope, you're going too far. So it's avoiding that boom and bust. Now, brain fog. Now, this is an interesting one. This can be both physiological and psychological. Um, we think that some of it may be due to inflammatory factors, which have affected the brain and live, lead to some cognitive impairments. But as therapists or clinicians dealing with these patients, we also need to think of, you know, what are the things that perhaps we can discuss or with patients to help. And one of those things would be sleep. We need to monitor also whether we think they're suffering from any depression and therefore, it, again, it may be a time to involve the GP. Anxiety and stress we know can make this worse. And decreased physical activity. So again, it's that play off with what, what works and what doesn't. And then it potentially could be side effects of any medication that they might have had to be put on. Now, shortness of breath. Now, for most persistent pain patients, this will be a, a, a new thing. Um, and it, I'm afraid it, it's really common. And I've got a number of patients who've had no actual clinical on, a, on assessment, no fibrosis or anything like that, but they still developed some breathing issues. The good news is that actually they respond really well to breathing techniques. Um, but they do present with this sort of altered breathing patterns, extreme shortness of breath and exercise, and they need some breathing exercises to re retrain. And we also keep an eye on anxiety and stress because that can also um, cause problems with shortness of breath. So we tend to teach them diaphragmatic breathing, and there's plenty of examples on how to do that. But put simply, it's just 
being in a comfortable position, we often start off with lying supine, so on their back with their knees bent up in a, a position of comfort with a hand on their stomach and then a hand on, on top on their sternum. And it's when you breathe in, your stomach should come out because you're using your diaphragm and you should get minimal movement up here. And it's just taking that time and working through slowly. But again, there's, there's, there'll be plenty of references for that. But breathing techniques work well and, and they need them. So I know a respiratory therapist who um, she's suffered from long COVID and she herself had to retrain her breathing, even though she was very familiar with it. So do bear that in mind, it, it, but it can make a difference, but it is a new thing. The only other thing I wanted to add to that is if you're noticing that there's an increase in shortness of breath or there's a problem, it may be that they need medical help and, and reassessment in terms of it, if there's medical intervention required. So what needs to be in place for these people? So I think it's vital to have a support network and I think I've highlighted that probably enough. We need to, as clinicians, monitor any significant changes. So if there's any significant deterioration, so it's just checking that you know when to call for help. Do they need a heart rate or an, uh, saturation monitors? So some people really benefit from having a heart rate monitor. And, um, and if they do, it's usually the easiest way is they just take it from the heart rate at rest and they only stay within a comfort zone of 10 to 20 percent rise above that and um, but some people find it's a problem and they become hyper vigilant and with the O2 monitor sometimes if you're concerned about someone that they are desaturating too quickly so they're dropping down then it may be worth them occasionally doing that and they sometimes find that desaturating even just with mental work rather than just physical Sleep, nutrition, lifestyle. So those are things that it may be that you need to refer on to others or certainly need a review and a discussion. Advising them the right online materials. So checking that they're using proper information and information that they understand. And so that's sometimes videos, sometimes printed stuff. And we also encourage them to get involved with some peer group forums. These can be helpful. There are you know, a number of them out there. Friends and family, check that they understand what's going on. So quite often do like a group session with the patient and, and perhaps their closest carer, um, just to go through exactly what's going on and, and try and explain and make it easier. So what are my take home tips? So this quite clearly needs to be patient centered. I really don't think I need to sort of spell that out too much, but it is such an individual thing, just as persistent pain is. But long COVID just has such a myriad of presentations, it's incredibly difficult. Call on medical help when indicated. So what I've been discussing potentially is, is usually patients who haven't needed any medical intervention and haven't got any medical underlying causes, but that doesn't mean that they don't have it. Check support in place. So that's the team. Acceptance. So having long COVID when you've also got persistent pain is a setback. But please tell them it is not the end of the road. It's a new road, slightly hilly, but it doesn't mean you won't get to your destination. And I think we need to think of it as a, a long term chronic disease. So it is a disease and a condition that needs to be managed. So we do need to bring in some of our self-management skills. And under the stand, the effect this has on the patient's lives, it, you know, it is hugely detrimental to their lives. And listen and do not judge. And bear in mind that we are all on a learning journey. So this is early days in this long COVID presentation and we're gathering data and research is happening all the time. So things are changing. So I'd like to really thank you for listening to my talk today. And I hope that that has been of some, some help. Again, I'd love you to look at um, our toolkit, pain toolkit for COVID. And um, please contact me if you have any questions, queries, or would like to discuss anything. I'm on Twitter at PhysioKTK. And thank you.
On behalf of the University of Sao Paulo School of Medicine and the Institute of Physical and Rehabilitation at the same hospital, I would like to deeply thank the International Association for the Study of Pain for the great honor of the opportunity to discuss or participate in this, in this very relevant discussion on maintaining a pain management regime with managing COVID-19. I have no financial disclosure or conflicts of interest with the material presented. And our main goals will be to inform main chronic symptoms developed by COVID-19 survivors, as well as describe main painful conditions in this patient population, so that hopefully we can strategize better ways to maintain a pain management regime with managing COVID-19. Interestingly, the World Health Organization dashboard usually informs the public and ourselves about the number of cases, confirmed cases, deaths, and even vaccinated people without within all the regions of the, the globe. As you all know, Brazil has been hit hard by the pandemic since last year and even worse this year. But again, just focusing on the number of uh, cases, confirmed cases, and number of deaths. By mid-August last year, our hospital has treated over 4,000 people with confirmed COVID-19 cases. And our question was, those people who were discharged home, which you can see is the majority of them, how will they survive this pandemic and after being uh, discharged? At that time, we had about over uh, uh, 560 patients with a similar uh, treatment profile, either from intensive care units or ward-based and with comorbidities, mainly hypertension and diabetes. Very interestingly, we identified that among all symptoms that these people self-reported, we identified that over 64% presented with at least few to, to severe and extreme uh, issues with pain and uh, discomfort. We used a visual analog scale to analyze these people, and you see that uh, over 46% of them present with 60 to 100 in a 0 to 100 scale. And it due to exacerbation of existing pain, but also the development of new painful conditions. Also, we identified that anxiety that, and depression was a symptom that was uh, clearly defined even for a few, few issues, but also extreme in a percentage that's considerable among our population. And when we try to understand the health condition in itself, we know that COVID-19 is a multi-organ, multi-system. Uh, health condition that may potentially affect any tissue or any cell in the body that contains this, those receptors, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, the ACE2 receptors, because this is the binding area with the virus and the hosting cell. We also know that SARS-CoV-2 has a neurotropism for the central nervous system, a neurotropism, and even through by the lungs or the olfactory nerves, they can easily reach the central nervous system, which, for example, in the brain, there are several structures and cells that contains those AC2 receptors and therefore are uh, targeted from the viral uh, infection. And we can have then several conditions that can be related to pain. For example, Parkinson's, encephalopathy, a stroke, Guillain-Barré, and even multiple sclerosis. Not only the brain, but other, other cells or other tissues or other organs are also affected. 
And sometimes we focus a lot on the effects of the virus and on those different tissues. So for example, as stressed earlier, these neuroimmune response uh, to the infection, the neurotropism, the, the several uh, painful neurological complications. But let us, let us remember that uh, more severely cases occur in people preferentially in the older population with some kind of comorbidity. And due to the treatment, for example, in our cohort, more uh, people also uh, on the intensive care unit and also using sometimes medications, even in the context of a clinical trial. So our most co common comorbidities like in the literature, hypertension and diabetes, but this post-intensive care syndrome, which is characterized by critical illness, polyneuropathy, myopathy, neuropathic pain, uh, people who are in, under prolonged ventilation and immobility with specifically in COVID-19 patients with this repeated proning, which can account for newly developed brachial plexopathy, joint subluxation, muscle pain, uh, they ride from the presence in an intensive care unit and some of these newly developed pain conditions, for example. Plus, the risk of procedural pain in patients who are due to mechanical ventilation, usually under sedation and cannot complain uh, pain and, and then have their proper management at that time. So this is well represented by this French study where they compared uh, uh, the, the self-reported pain and discomfort and the difference between those who were in the uh, post discharges from intensive care units and, and the ward care, so more, more intense, but also other symptoms, including uh, fatigue, loss of memory, dyspnea and sleep disorders. These findings were confirmed by another study, British study, where among most persistent symptoms in post-COVID survivors, for example, eight, four to eight weeks after hospital discharge, pain is one of them, and it's more frequent in those who were in, treated in intensive care units. But let, let's not forget that, again, fatigue, the post-stress, uh, traumatic stress syndrome, uh, but also anxiety, depression, concentration problems are also common in this patient population. And also when we compare uh, people who are in the wards or in the intensive care unit, uh, pain is not uh, managed or not, does not change their uh, frequency, yeah? especially in the, those in the intensive care unit. For example, in this big cohort or with over 1,700 patients from the Yuhan area from China, they, they show a low uh, prevalence of uh, self-reported pain, for example, 27%, but most of their patients are, were treated in, uh, in ward, not in the intensive care units, but also with this complaints of muscle weakness, sleep disturbances, and anxiety and depression. But the profile of pain is quite similar throughout uh, our findings, but also in the published papers already, which means the majority with pain, joint pain, uh, chest pain, myalgia, and headache. When we compare those people with pain and uh, to a healthy volunteer in the same area at the same time, we see a significant difference in these this prevalences. And again, we know that uh, Italy last year was also a country with a no high number of cases. We also see similar results, emphasizing then again, the prevalence of joint and muscle pain, chest pain and headache. And another Italian study demonstrating that uh, three to four months after hospital discharge, yes, the, 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 the prevalence of these symptoms decreased. So for example, joint pain, myalgia, however, is still present, uh, present over uh, four months after hospital discharge. This is also found in the French study. 
The main component that we should remember is that these people with, let's say, for example, with the pre-existing pain condition, if not properly managed, and the dorsal horn of the spinal cord continue to receive those bombardment of nociceptive stimuli, will uh, produce, uh, consequently, uh, a greater involvement of the peripheral and central nervous system, as in we all, all know, uh, augmenting or increasing the area or the representation of that pain. So therefore, indicating that proper management uh, in a timely basis would be very important to better address in an optimized way these people. And the challenge that we also have is because physical examination will show which areas to target, but maybe this is compromised due to social distancing. I always like to highlight and uh, deeply thank Professor Lars Red Nielsen for bringing to the literature this, this concept that for a same damage in the structure, in the anatomical structure, you can have a myriad of symptoms just time-wise uh, that are, have prob uh, different treatment strategies. For example, uh, in the first case, in the very localized pain, but when it spreads to a higher levels at the spinal cord or the brain levels. And this concept is very important because some uh, strategies that are commonly given in guidelines, if we don't take this concept into account, we will be giving patients treatments that we know uh, are, uh, let's say, independent uh, predictors for low response if you have, for example, low pressure thresholds. So besides the painful condition itself, it's always very important to remember that these people have already depression, anxiety, fatigue, muscle weakness, which can uh, more involve even more the joints uh, uh, as a consequence, but also this post-traumatic stress, sleep disorders, which will require multidisciplinary strategies. And more than ever, I think these chronic people will need a, not only the adequate control of, of pain, but this will necessarily involve at least a full assessment of the psychological uh, issues, uh, also the deconditioning or the fatigue, but also the exercise and also the sleep. So we need to assess then to better uh, promote the strategies. For multidisciplinary programs, it's very important the active participation of uh, patients. However, as mentioned earlier, there is a deficit in memory and attention and concentration. The speed of mental processing can be decreased. So this is also a target area that we should take into account when creating our treatment uh, protocols to manage these people, which would definitely include a full assessment and a uh, so that we can do management. All of this requires the call for action. And hopefully the IASP can be a catalyst for action in terms of increasing collective action identifying mid and long-term impact of COVID-19 pandemic for people with pain. I have focused myself on our assessment on survivors from hospital treatment, but we have those who were not treated, those who were asymptomatic during acute phase, those who were not infected, but are in a social distancing environment. So in order to reduce unmet healthcare needs related to pain, introduce comprehensive and integrated approaches in order to improve outcomes, and most important to guide collection of data to monitor the status of these people in different health conditions in the post COVID-19 area. With this, I thank you very much, all of you for your kind attention and are here for answering all the questions that can emerge. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm, I am back. I am Michael, uh, your moderator for this session, and I am now joined by our four presenters who are with us live today. Um, first, thank you all very much. I, I'm 
I'm grateful and I'm, I'm kind of excited that I get to moderate this session because they were all so, so good. And I think they intertwined very well. Um, the OT nerd in me is very excited to get into conversation and questions for all of y'all. Um, we have a few questions to go around. Um, and I'm thinking we'll probably end a little bit early, uh, which means I will exert my moderator privileges and ask some of my own nerdy questions myself. So we'll get to that in a bit. But first, I think we'll start with, um, Andrea, I feel like this might be directed towards you. Um, and this is a question from Shahid. And they ask, um, well, they talk about that uh, cannabis is becoming, cannabis usage is becoming more popular in post-COVID patients for self-pain management, especially in their district. Um, do you have any comments towards that? Okay, thank you. Um, cannabis has uh, been uh, legalized in Canada for anyone to use and to buy in 2018. And we had a medical marijuana program since 2001. Um, so it's very popular here in Canada. People can use for a variety of symptoms. The, the problem with using medical cannabis for symptoms post COVID is that we don't have evidence that it works and that we don't have evidence that it may be causing more damage than benefit because we know THC uh, is a medication, it's a, it's a substance that can treat neuropathic pain, um, but it causes euphoria, it causes uh, problems with the psychotropic effects, poor concentration, people is dangerous to drive and, and work, and CBD, uh, which causes sleepiness. Uh, a lot of people use it for uh, anxiety and to sleep better. Uh, we don't know if this is what these people need, but I know a lot of people self-medicate with them, uh, both THC, CBD, or one of them. Uh, and um, I usually don't recommend smoked uh, versions because of the lung damage, but if they want to use oral forms, I'm okay with that, as long as they don't take too high doses. Right, right. Sounds like it would be something as well that just uh, naturally is going to be from patient to patient, client to client. You would have to yes. you know, establish a plan with that regardless, right? Yes. Okay. Um, does anybody else want to contribute or add to that? Yes, yes Michael. Yes, and also if we, if we evaluate the profile of these people, uh, not the majority will fill in the criteria of neuropathic pain. I think this in our, in our cohort, we saw less than 10%, maybe about 7 to 8%. So I think the physical examination, a proper indication, even for the medications, is really needed. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, I want to address this next question as well, from Shahid as well. Um, and they're talking about um, specific to, to their region um, in the post-COVID population, uh, malaise is, uh, before starting work is more common and gradually started settling down with the work as, as they proceeded. What are some of the causes of that or what is your sort of impression of, of that phenomenon that, that Shahid is seeing? But starting work has has decreased the malaise. Is that is that what he's saying? Yeah, he's saying that initially that 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 concept and the feeling of malaise is 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 seems to be more profound when they first get back into work, and then as they're working and as they get back into life, I think um, they're seeing that that start to decrease. What's sort of the group's impression on that? I think you know this relapsing nature. I, I don't know what sort of numbers he's he's seeing. Certainly, in my experience, um, and the people that I work with, and my personal experiences, I did continue working, and actually that set me back quite a way. And any time that I push myself a little bit further into working a bit more, so I'm working part time now rather than full time, um, I do have setbacks. But it's a bit more complicated than just going back to work. There could be other factors involved. What else is going on in that person's day and in their life? Um, so I'm not sure, Katie, 
Well, I mean, all I'd say that maybe these people have a better way of scheduling. So it may be that they're monitoring their sleep a bit better because they know they've got work. So what you sometimes find, isn't it, is that you struggle to get any sort of normality. So maybe for some, but I'm the same as usual. And it's not something I'm that familiar with. But there are some people that because it makes them adapt a little bit, they have a set time they go to bed, a set time that they wake up or at least start activities that can be beneficial I guess the other thing to mention is values right so again what we see with people with persistent pain is if we get back to living life by our values we can see some improvement so could it be that in those people the OT says absolutely yes that is the answer <laughs> Um, okay, this next question, um, uh, before I have y'all answer, I think there's, there's probably a point of clarification that probably needs to be made, um, and, and I'll go ahead and set that. But Chris asked the question, um, a clinician in the previous session, and this was our physio, uh, Dr. Baptiste, Dr. Baptiste, Dr. Baptiste, duh, sorry, um, talked about uh, research and studies that, that um, I think a colleague had, had engaged in revolved around um, high-level athletes engaging in four to six hours of intense physical training, and then the rest of their time was, was spent during this, this time of, of sedentary activities, um, you know, like hours of watching TV or just laying around. Now, he emphasized that this was detrimental and they needed to be coached to engage in regular movement throughout the day. Now, Chris is curious, how is this different than um, the concept that many of y'all were discussing about pacing and ensuring that you get adequate rest? Um, now, I want to I want to clarify that 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 research is 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 not talking about people with with pain and talking about people with, um, you know, recovering from COVID. So very different situations. But I mean, when we're talking about, you know, in this population where they're, they're uh maybe experiencing more sedentary activities versus in this population where we're advocating for, um, I don't know that sedentary is the right word to advocate that we're advocating for, but, but pacing, you know, making sure you, you go at your own, um, whatever your, your, your own uh, personal in intuition says. So, uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that study, um, so I couldn't really comment on that. But what we do know is that pushing through doesn't work and is hugely detrimental to this cohort of patients. And that's with or without persistent pain. We will not recommend it. I don't think it will ever be recommended again. For some people, that's not saying that there are some caveats. There's some people that can do that, but it would never be a blanket recommendation. It's very individual. Um, with the post-exertion malaise, you know, you just don't want to bring that on because that's a huge setback for these people. And so you've got to respect that. So you've got to get people to understand pacing and the pacing is their own pacing, not someone else's. I mean, we tend to talk about, when I talk about pacing in the clinic is you do 50% of what you think you can do. You don't go just to the line, you go way back from the line, and then you can always build from that. But the problem is, if you do this boom and bust, we know with this sort of presentation, it doesn't work in general. There's always exceptions to every rule, but in general, we wouldn't push it. But, you know, the activity levels of someone who's normally doing loads and loads of sport and things it will be different from a housewife. So, you know, there's a huge... Between. It's so important to... to um to make the plan uh, unique to each individual patient. And it isn't it, I mean, just the concept of pacing in and of itself is so subjective. And so it has to be important to define pacing with that individual patient, probably at each each patient. Is, it, is, that, is that a fair Absolutely. assumption? Absolutely, yeah, no, it's individual, isn't it? It's a, yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. The, the, this whole thing is such an individual experience, as we know. Um, and, and that's the same with the pain experience. Right, so. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I was gonna get to. It goes back to what Sharon was talking about, about listening and knowing your patients, right? I mean, there's so much uh, unique and individual perspectives that must be considered when developing a plan or coming up with, a, with an idea of what pacing might look like for any individual patient. And that pacing might look different from week to week, from month mm -hmm. to month. True. You know, one week you may be able to do a little bit more and then, you know, four weeks later, the, the picture looks different. So it's just assessing that and, and knowing what's going on for you and listening again to your patients. Very true, very true. Michael, awesome. Michael, yes. yes. 
I would like to deeply thank you for your clarification because I attended the previous session and I think Chris, um, your question goes uh, to the athletes that not necessarily have any pain complaints, but please do remember that COVID-19, and there are several publications on it already, affects predominantly the fibers, the, the aerobic fibers within a muscle set. Uh, different from what we see in sarcopenia and in uh, elderly people, which mainly affects fib fiber two uh, and within the muscle. So it's really important to assess your patient, as mentioned earlier, at the individual level uh, before uh, asking them to blindly go back to their previous activity without at least assessing their needs. For example, when we test our patients, they may have grade five in, uh, in you know, that uh, MCR, the Medical Research Counseling Scale, but when you induce electrical stimulation, this muscle do not respond. So uh, again, yes, at the individual level, but when you're talking about athletes and muscle activity return after COVID-19, especially if the, the athlete has been in an intensive care unit with all the post-intensive care, the autonomic uh, involvement, uh, then it's very important even within each muscle to be targeted in your intervention. And as we are treating these people with pain, with malaise, with fatigue, with muscle weakness, which is an important clinical finding, you will be amazed that when the, the treatment is targeted, it's, it's impressive how quickly they recover, uh, even if in long COVID, like one year after hospital discharge. So, and another point I think that I would like to highlight is nothing that we knew before maybe fits because it's, as, as Sharon already said, and Katie and Professor Fordle, it's a myriad of complaints and different in each individual. And thank you so much, Chris, for bringing out that not, uh, not necessarily people with COVID-19 or affected uh, only, but those who are in social distancing and still not active with the sedentary pattern should also be our uh, target and, and concern. Thank you. Absolutely. Well said, well said. Thank you, Martha. Um, we'll get into our last question. And I think this question is really speaking towards um, I think the new world and the new environment of which many of us are either receiving services as patients or giving services as clinicians or physicians. Um, this is specific to telehealth, teletherapy, teleservice, whatever your geographic region is deciding to call it at the moment. Um, and this is from Jennifer. And Jennifer says, first off, thank you all for your presentations. Um, any comments or suggesting, suggestions regarding telehealth uh, telehealth barrier solutions for more elderly patients, specifically revolved around technology issues and technology challenges. Um, she says, uh, when the patient is isolated at home without direct IT help, um, you know, she's not a tech expert. Um, what are some issues or some, um, maybe some answers or some solutions that you all have, have experienced or have had to learn through trial and error? Um, what's working? What types of suggestions can you give? I, I can start with that because we had a very nice uh, story in Ontario. Um, so for many, many years in Ontario, we have uh, telehealth, which is using a Ontario telehealth network, OTN, which is a video conferencing system that is not user-friendly. And um, we always had difficulties. And thanks to the pandemic, <laughs> The pandemic was amazing because then the government allowed us to use telephone with patients. We could not do that before. We, well, you could talk to the telephone on the patient, but it was not recognized as a consult. There was no guidance about privacy and no billing code. So if you talk to the patient, you could not bill the system, the, pri the provincial payer here is the provincial system. So thanks to the pandemic, we are now able to talk to our patients via telephone and build the government for that, uh, how many minutes we spoke. And that was amazing, simple telephone. I think even the elderly, most elderly people um, appreciate and they have a phone that's not technologically, they don't need to be technologically savvy. And our patients loved that because mm. 
and, and we are thinking, we are pledging our government to keep that those billing codes after the pandemic finishes because everybody lost. Our consults are much more efficient now. I, I had patients that they had to you know, travel 45 minutes to come to downtown Toronto to see me. So I, I thought they, you know, just to discuss one question. And they stayed half an hour in front of me chatting, chatting, chatting. And we talked about the weather, we talked about this and that. Now with telephone, we are much more efficient. Five, seven minutes, I'm done. And I asked them, do you have more questions for today? No, no, doctor, I have to go wash my dishes and do something. So I can talk to many more patients because we are doing telephone calls. So that would be my recommendation for you. I know she's in South Africa, Jennifer, and uh, maybe you can start incorporating that. Awesome, awesome. It, Jennifer, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Michael, yes. Maybe I, I also provide the input for the uh, uh, middle high income country, Brazil, even though we are in Sao Paulo, major city, telehealth was a major asset during pandemic. So I would say that uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic was an accelerator for the process. Because for example, even in medicine, it, the legislation as Professor Andrea already mentioned in terms of uh, uh, the, the safety, you cannot just use a phone because it's a consultation. So, so, and some of, because we work in a multidisciplinary coordinated ultra integrated team. So for example, for some of our professionals, I highlighted the social workers, even psychologists from the legislation's perspective in Brazil it was really hard to implement telehealth uh, when, within this, uh, um, our collaborators. But because of the pandemic and last year, there was the only way to access some patients, then it was a, a must have, at least temporarily. And then as Professor Andrea said, not only in Toronto, Canada, but also in Brazil and several other areas in the world captured by the World Health Organization uh, interim, um, they, they made a, a post analysis. It was a, a way to move forward and to mainly access people. Another good example is that by assessing people, for example, as um, the question was raised, for example, for the elderly, uh, even family members, the, the, the time of innovation and creativity. But again, phoning the patients by different team members that we escalate, schedule to contact patients were really, really a way to enter people's house or, or even sometimes when it's tele, it, it, you can see their environment. So it's a huge gain. And even for the medical st students in our university, we had the honor and privilege to have Professor Furla <laughs> addressing our medical students using uh, you know, technology. So it is a way that for sure, hopefully it will may be maintained even after uh, you know, this more severe parts of the pandemic. So it's a tool everybody should be taking advantage and rather than uh, trying to innovate and see ways to people to, to reach or to be reached. Yeah, awesome. I mean, my, sorry, my thing was just that you keep it as simple as possible. Um, so, I mean, we've got a bit more flexibility in our system potentially and we've been using telephone for, for many years in the NHS and telephone, yes, absolutely does work, but actually don't write off the elderly with video. Um, I have many patients who are over 75 and, and quite happy to do video consultations as long as it's simple and they don't have to download lots of new software. So let's not, you know, underestimate, but yeah, make it accessible. If they can't do the video, have the phones ready. That's mine. Yeah, absolutely. And I know for myself, uh, the past couple of years, I've been working in pediatrics and obviously opposite end of the spectrum. However, some of them and their little fingers cannot operate, you know, some of the technology for 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 in person or a telehealth visit. Um, and so sometimes, you know, some of the, the work ahead of time, it, I found to be very valuable communicating with parents in our elderly population, it could be communicating um, with other family members, uh, younger children that might be in the home. Um, and having some of those things set up, you know, most of the steps set up so that, like Katie said, maybe it's just the press of one button when the session begins, um, really make some of those things uh, much easier for, for our patients and for our clients. Um, before I get into my nerdiness and ask my question, I want to open the floor to our presenters and see if there's anything 
um, any of y'all want to, to say or to clarify or to, to ask of one another? I had one question, Sharon. You talked about um, using your uh, monitor, didn't you? So uh, you did use a heart rate monitor and you found that valuable for you. And I just, could you just quickly tell us how you found it useful? Yeah, um, heart rate monitor, uh, yeah, mixed really is probably my feeling on it. I still use it. Um, so each morning I will take my um, heart rate and heart rate variability. Uh, so that's the interval between heartbeats uh, for people who are watching. And it just gives me a baseline of where I'm at. It also tells me if I'm sympathetically activated or parasympathetically activated or balanced. And if I'm balanced, it guides me towards saying you can do a little bit more activity today. But what I've noticed that sometimes it gets it wrong. It tells me I'm balanced, but I know within myself that I'm feeling really tired. And when I've pushed through and believed you know, the app, the heart rate variability app, I've, I've kind of suffered a little bit for that. So it's knowing yourself and using this technology and, and having a, that kind of balance between the two, because I think we know within ourselves what might be useful. The heart rate variability is useful in, I've used it for particular tasks. So if I'm reading, I might just monitor what that variability looks like for a period of time, or if I'm watching TV or doing a particular activity or walking downstairs just to see what it's like. But for some people, I think it can be alarming. You know, it looks like your, your heart rate is skyrocketing, which mine does just walking down the stairs. So it's how useful might it be for that person? Um, I think that's an individual call. Does that answer your question, Katie? Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Um, and because I'm, I'm, I'm someone that lives with chronic pain and someone that practices, I have to touch on a couple of the things that I, I heard in uh, Sharon's uh, presentation that I just, I just absolutely love, to be completely honest. Um, there were a couple of things. You started off by saying that it's important to learn from your patients and to listen to your patients because they are the experts. And, and regardless of pain, they are the experts of what they are experiencing, right? And, and I absolutely love that. And later on, you talked about how you were told to exercise. And I don't know if that sat, sat very well for you. But, I, and then you went on to say later on, and I picked up on this hoping, you know, in the in a way that uh, you would hope that a clinician would listen and hear what you're saying, you said, but I love to read, I love books. Like those two pieces in and of itself, you know, yes, you know, we're trying to get movement and, and exercise or, or whatever that might mean. But for you, it was like exercise wasn't what was meaningful to you. If we could have built an activity that would uh, allow you to get some type of meaningful movement built around books and built around reading, I feel like that would have suited you and your therapy plan much more appropriate than, you know, whatever the, the stereotypical, oh yeah, go do, you know, a mile of walking or whatever may have been. Is that fair to say? I think that's the same with um, anything, isn't it? Whether it's with, you know, persistent pain or anyone who's healthy, please do something that's meaningful, meaningful for you um, rather than, you know, a printed out sheet that gives you the same exercise as the next person. Um, What's meaningful to me, yeah, is reading, um, is yoga. Um, every time I try, try to do some just gentle yoga or stretching, I was set back and realized, okay, I can't do that at the moment. I've got to accept that. What can I do? Very little was the answer to that to start <laughs> off with. But, you know, hey, I started with some breathing exercises, got some enjoyment out of that, just looking out of the window and seeing the blue sky or... <laughs> Right. You know, well, and don't forget, rest is an, an exercise. A rest is a treatment. Yeah, yes. absolutely. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I, I think your presentations were phenomenal. I think the conversations that we were able to have in such a short period of time, I think is way more worth than it, than, than the value that it's that it, that we could capture in this small short time. Um, with that, again, thank you all to our presenters. Thank you all for everyone that joined us. Um, thank you for those that engaged with us and asked questions. Um, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and end this session. Um, we hope that you will join us for the rest of 
today, the rest of tomorrow for the future sessions. Um, I'm sure they will be just as good. Um, and with that, thank you all, and we will see you next time.